In this short presentation, we're going to look briefly at the conceptual structure behind development of visualization and dashboards. Visualization is essentially a cognitive agent, which means that we use it as a way of making sense of complexity. More importantly, visualization makes analytics products available to the broadest possible audience. Not everyone that engages or that benefits from learning analytics needs to be a data scientist. So quite often, the type of work that individuals are engaged in when they're conducting analytics is making their products readily understandable or usable by other individuals, whether that's a faculty member or whether that's an administrator or whether that's a student. Now underpinning this, it's worth taking just a second to look a little bit at what is it about today's context, today's society that makes learning analytics or visualization of data in general needed or required. This gets back to a statement from P.W. Anderson where he stated more is different. So if we're interacting with a small amount of data, let's say if we have four or five students in a classroom, we'll do a good job of being able to understand where they are and how they're progressing. If you suddenly have dozens of students or even hundreds of students, suddenly it becomes difficult to track the progress of each individual learner. The same concept holds true around data. If you have a small amount of data, you can likely make sense of it just by looking at it, uh, reading it or reviewing it. You might have to do some aggregating or you might have to do some rough visualizations in a tool like Excel, but that's really the extent of it. But when you have a huge amount of data, such as you might get for a click stream in an open online course or just in an existing learning management system that you're using, all of a sudden you need new approaches to make sense of it and more importantly to communicate to others how that makes sense. Now in fairness, this isn't entirely new. Uh, going back to 1550, there was declarations that we have a confusing and harmful abundance of books. So people have historically tried to make sense of this kind of abundance through different approaches. So there's a range of methods that have been used. For example, with an encyclopedia, creating an index of indexes. So you start to pull together or aggregate. Or you might start to create abstractions, which means that you don't quite have the same data set at place, but you try to put rough visualizations and even some of the work of da Vinci in early representations of information. Uh, there was this type of an approach being utilized. So broadly, it's this approach where you try and take your data that's too broad to be apprehended cognitively and put it into a format that someone can understand. More recently, there's been an approach where we're trying to make patterns or to understand patterns through software or through analytics tool sets. In some cases, this is the idea of the trails of many, where if you take, for example, the interactions and the edits that a group of individuals have done on a site like Wikipedia, you can start to see some patterns in their interactions. So roughly then, the problem that analytics and visualization seeks to solve or address is this idea of information abundance. Or put another way, visualization is essentially a brokering entity that helps us to make sense of quantity and treats it like a cognitive agent, essentially. So it's a tool to think with. But it's important to recognize that with visualization, we're really still part of this broader legacy, if you will, of trying to make sense of information from a narrative perspective. So we socialize and we share and we engage. And as you start working this week in Tableau and you start to create some various dashboards or start to create some visualizations of the data sets that you're working with, one of the first things that you'll see come out of it is the, the need to communicate or tell the story that's behind it or create or communicate a series of views or hypotheses. And so generally, because we can't socialize the data we have, we turn to technical approaches and analytics models. Even then, once we have those models or we have those visualizations, we turn back to social discourse to share with others and to make sense of it. Some of the tool sets, you may have played with a few of these or heard of these. Tools like Core Signals, which is a predictive model, uh, predictive modeling uh, software that helps to identify students that might be at risk of dropping out. Degree Compass, which was recently purchased by Desire to Learn, which allows individuals to move through a particular set of course topics or courses, I should say, based on what might be the best next course for them to take for success. And Social Networks Adapting Pedagogical Practice, the uh, a browser plugin that allows for the creation of uh, networks or social networks that was developed by a colleague, Shane Doss. And so the value of, of using these kinds of tools and approaches then is we can quickly communicate what something means or what exists within a particular space. For example, this is an illustration of the history of primarily Western philosophy. Now, if you zoomed in, if you go to the 
the website and you zoom in, you can start to see how individual philosophers have influenced one another. Or if you look at this image, it looks at uh, co-authorship networks um, that exist in certain, uh, uh, certain publication systems, and these networks provide value in beginning to understand what's a prominent voice or what's a prominent uh, individual in this system. So when you look at something like this, this could include thousands or even tens of thousands of citations and papers, which would be impossible to understand these particular configurations, but by looking at it in this format, you can quickly identify some critical individuals. Or another illustration is the evolution of uh, chemistry research and the relationships between those spaces as well. And you can quickly start to see what are some of the key or central hubs of research and which hubs perhaps are a little more periphery. For example, if you look at the top left, things like law aren't tightly integrated within the evolution of chemistry research, and yet you'll see things like uh, computer science or computer technology starting to grow in influence. Another quick illustration is just trying to understand funding patterns that might exist. In this case, it's uh, the Department uh, of Energy's funding patterns in a few particular areas. So these are just ways, again, of taking a large quantity of data and rendering it in a format that can be used as a social object to communicate and interact with others. Another approach is using discourse analysis or just understanding how conversations evolve, how rhetorical moves shape a, the development of particular ideas. And as we move into a little bit further in the course, we're going to certainly go much deeper into text analysis and understanding some of those elements. But for now, the main point to try and communicate here is the value of visualizations in rendering what may be difficult to understand more understandable. And so you'll be using Tableau this week, which has some interesting features from a visualization perspective. Also the benefit of being able to embed your visualizations in your blog or on your site to try and communicate some of the data or some of the insight that you've gathered from the data that you've been analyzing.